way too many slides and I'm not even covering all of them. That's well, you know, how that, many people there were. You know, that, that would probably make a great article for the Friends of Acadia Journal too. It would make an awesome, and you know what, it's not the first time people have looked into women of Acadia and sometimes, you know, donors, but then also going beyond that to actual women employees at Acadia National Park, you know, people who've been women um, in the position for FOA as president of FOA. So there's a big role that uh, women have played in forming Acadia National Park and keeping it going. Yeah. So we're so talking, you, go ahead. I'm just saying we're talking, I'm kind of focused just on those gilded era um, women who started with Eliza Homans in 1908 and kind of, you know, right up into the last one that I took a look at, Christine Rowell, out on Clefstone. Uh, her estate was the Barbary Ledge estate. Mm -hmm. And she gave all of that. She was there watching her house burn down in a matter of three seconds. Um, it's just heartbreaking. She gave the land afterwards to the park. And um, so that's, that's the whole uh, raison d'etre of this talk is to just honor these women. They're rather unheralded and they're adorable. Just looking at all their pictures, I think they're, they're terrific. This is a great uh, preview because we are live on Facebook now. Oh, geez. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if anyone's watching, but. <laughs> So, um, you know, the other thing that I really wanted to make clear is this is not my original research at all. I don't want anybody to go, oh my gosh, wait a second, plagiarism. I've read a ton of books. And so I'm just here to share what I read about, not to claim that, you know, I did all this research. I read a lot and I read a ton of the newspaper archives. Uh, so that's my... Um, right up front disclaimer. I nice. think it, yeah. So I just think it's a uh, great fun and I hope other people sort of dive in and get catch the same bug and find out more and more about our fascinating history and the people here. They, they're amazing characters. Yeah. So okay. wherever I've been walking the last uh, week or so, Therese, I've been thinking about your talk. Oh, good. <laughs> Uh, because I've been walking on the land that you're going to be talking about tonight. So, Yeah, well, um, one of the things that also struck me is that many of the, you know, summer residents, like we, we like to call them, um, actually are multi-generational. They may be fourth generation, their families have been coming up here in summering. So their connection to the island is deep, it's heartfelt, it's family oriented. And that's something that I think comes out when you see the donation, like this is a treasured childhood memory. That's why Eliza Holmans wanted to give the park the bowl and the beehive. She was quoted as saying, if I don't give this to the park, who knows, my grandkids will come here and there'll be a merry-go-round on the top of um, the beehive. So she did not want it spoiled. And Eleanor Satterley, she grew up here. That was J.P. Morgan's granddaughter. And this was home to her. She did not want it spoiled. And she gave it to all of us to enjoy. I thought, what an amazing donation that had a real personal quality to it. So that's another thing that I'm very touched by, their stories. Well, looks like we have uh, Gary Stelvlog joining us. Hey, Gary. Hey, hey. Hey, Gary. It's Earl. Hi. Hey, Earl. Cool. Oh. Hi, everyone. I'm here. Hey, Kay. Hello, Kay. Hi. Hey. Hello. Hey, Donna's here, too. Hi, Donna. Hello there. How are you? Good. We had somebody else for a minute, minute and they may be back. <laughs> we scared them off. Yeah. Well, 
Welcome, Mary. Hello. <laughs> And actually, you know, with with this talk, I, you know, I don't think I have the qualifications to do it, but maybe somebody in the park does have the qualifications to put together um, a more professional um, presentation about this, maybe a booklet or an article, like you were saying, Earl, yeah. for way. You know, they have actually, you know, focused on women of Acadia in the past, but maybe expanded a little bit more. There's some really cool gals cool. out there, and it would be... Uh, really fun if someone could take this like if I could take my information and just hand it over to someone and see what do, they do a core dump <laughs> <laughs> hi Becky and Doug have joined us hi Becky I think she's muted right now so there she is hi hi there how are you all doing good welcome you too this is way past my bedtime. I'll never do a seven o'clock talk. <laughs> oh, come on. You're not that old. <laughs> you're young. If you can hike 10 miles a day, you're doing great. Well, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's wild. I, I heard you guys on Facebook a little bit today. Oh, in our practice? Oh, we were practicing. <laughs> I know, but it was live. How I know, I know. I had to just do it. I deleted it, though. You guys, oh, I, I, I just was there. flipping through, and I didn't know what I was seeing, and I'm like, well, I don't know. <laughs> I hear Carolyn going, I don't know how to delete this. <laughs> <laughs> I figured it out eventually. <laughs> Those were the funny. famous last words of Rosemary Wood. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. Oh, hi, Betty. Good morning, afternoon, hey, evening Stephanie. it is. Hi, Betty. <laughs> yeah, good to see good everyone. Morning. Well, it is seven o'clock. Okay. So I am going to um, ask everyone to mute, or I will mute you, except for um, our speaker, Therese. And I'm going to start our recording. And. Um, I want to welcome you tonight. Um, I'm Carolyn Rupkevian. I'm the executive director of the Bar Harbor Historical Society. And we welcome you to our third virtual program. Tonight's speaker is Therese Miller. She is an avid fan of Acadia National Park. And for the past 32 years has researched island history and the fascinating individuals who shaped the development of the island as a tourist destination. She's met lots of local families teaching at the grade schools on the island, and she's an active docent at the Bar Harbor Historical Society. Tonight, she'll be speaking about the women of Acadia who opened their pocketbooks to give generously in land purchases and funds to build trails not just for themselves, but for all of us to enjoy. So Therese, thank you very much for uh, giving us this uh, lecture tonight. And um, let's see, I'm just gonna mute a couple more people and we're ready to go. You ready? Yes. So I'm go yes. Green. Here we go. And. Here. And all right, so hope all the folks can hear me. So if you missed my preamble, I'm just going to repeat myself. Um, I worked on the Sea Princess boat for a while, and we would often tell our visitors about Acadia National Park, one of the only parks that had been created from private donations, not a single taxpayer dollar. And folks thought that was incredibly special. So I went to the Hancock County Trustees booklet to see who these people were and learn a little bit more about these generous folks. And I was really shocked to find that how many people were women. I've looked at lots of history of Acadia um, books and I don't see their faces as much as I see the men. So that made me curious. And this presentation is the unheralded heroines of Acadia National Park. I have uh, 
way too many slides for you guys. I've done a lot of research, so we'll get through as much as possible. Um, I want you to first think about the social context in which these women of Acadia found themselves. At this time, the Gilded Era, the convergence of the Industrial Revolution, the consequential amassing of enormous wealth in a small elite group, the burgeoning conservation concerns in response to the pollution created by the Industrial Revolution, and finally, the suffragette movement to acquire equal rights for women to vote. So by that, I mean that these women were stepping up and starting to you know, take a more active role in molding our society, and they had the, so they had the means to um, make a lot of contributions. So how did these women of Acadia become connected to Mount Desert Island in the beginning? So way back in 1855, before Acadia was a park or people came to, before the Rusticator era, era actually started, Thomas Cole, he was a artist, he was, he had formed the Hudson River School of Art, and he came to Mount Desert Island expressly to find regions of unspoiled landscape. He told his fellow artists, go out there and paint this beautiful unspoiled landscape quick before we ruin it all. Yes. So he was our uh, forerunner of the conservation movement. And one of his students was Frederick Church. Frederick Church had a friend, Charles Tracy. Charles Tracy came to MDI in 1855, bringing the whole family with him. So they, Frederick Church took him down to uh, Schooner Head, and this is the Lynham's farm. It's the same place that Thomas Cole stayed at when he came. Remember, there were no hotels. So these artists came and just, you know, had a room in a local farm. And what was so captivating for the artist and city visitor? What do you see when you see this picture of the Lynham farm? It seems so rustic and simple. And look at that adorable rickety little fence there. They talked about, in his, in his diary, they talked about crossing the meadow. We met Mr. Lynham, the patriarch, whose life began here and whose 60 years have passed on this spot. And we all were struck with his strong and superior countenance. Well, that sounds pretty noble and, and, and maybe a little exaggerated until you think about what they were coming from. The industrial towns that they were leaving to come up here to MDI were dirty. They contained many polluting factories. So for them, the Lynham farm represented a bucolic unspoiled landscape. Here is a painting that Frederick Church did inspired by the sawmill at the Lynham farm. So one of the members of Charles Tracy's family is, was Fanny Tracy. And she was about 14 years old and she started a multi-generational relationship with Mount Desert Island. She fell in love with this place. She grew up and uh, married J.P. Morgan and actually brought J.P. Morgan here to Mount Desert for their honeymoon. They apparently were not that um, compatible as companions. He preferred a more hectic social life, travel, sumptuous luxury, but Fanny kind of caught the bug of MDI. She preferred a quieter, more domestic life with her children. So here is their family of four children and the tallest adorable cherub in the back there, that's Louisa. And so Louisa and the, her brothers and sisters actually summered up here on the island. And when Louisa grew up, she married Herbert Satterley. Herbert Satterley was a partner to J.P. Morgan. And what what J.P. Morgan brought to MDI can't be understated. Once he came, all of his fellow business partners also came to MDI. So that's really what brought these wealthy people. In essence, it's Fanny who started the, the whole tourist industry. Here are uh, Louise's two daughters, granddaughters of Fanny. They're Eleanor and Mabel. Eleanor is um, right there on the left. Here's a picture of Louisa Herbert and Eleanor and a beautiful uh, natural scenery of them down at Great Head. So when 
uh, J.P. Morgan gave uh, Louisa, his daughter, a gift of Great Head in Sand Beach. They did not build a big palatial mansion. Remember, she was struck by the simple rustic cottage style. So they had a series of bungalows. They called it the dining, um, the dining camp and the sleeping camp and grandma's camp. They had a pretty uh, stone tea house right out on Great Head. You can see they built, uh, put together uh, a boat shed from remnants of the Tay. Uh, and Eleanor, the daughter, actually got married right there down on Sand Beach. It would be up on the gardens that were designed by Beatrix Farron. And so she's right behind the sand dunes. That's where this is taking place. And here we come to Fanny Tracy Morgan. She's in her morning clothes. J.P. Morgan has died. She's still coming to MDI. And there they are right in front of the Lineham farm. And she's, she's sitting and right next to her is George Doris. So they had a very close relationship. Here is Eleanor Morgan Satterley. Unfortunately, Eleanor suffered from a lot of um, poor health. And uh, after, the, after her mother died in 1946, the next year her father died. The fire of 47 swept through and burned down most of the estate. She was really keen to make sure the land um, went to the park, but it was tied up in a uh, trust, um, just some complications. So she actually reached into her own pocket and she bought back her own inheritance for $22,000 and gave it all to us. So that's Eleanor Morgan Satterley. And there's a, a lovely plaque. Um, it's at the top of the Sand Beach stairs and you can see that. So Schooner Head, where they were at, if you look at the map on the left, there's the Lynham Farm. It's the only thing around. And then take a look at the 1887 map. Whoa, it just exploded. So these are, uh, the Hale family, Dalton's, Francis, Brigham's, these are all summer people who built their summer cottages down on Schooner Head. Eden Street really hadn't, you know, exploded as the place to be. It was actually Schooner Head. So our next uh, lady is Eliza Homans, and she had her estate um, also down on S Schooner Head Road. Um, she enjoyed extensive travels throughout Europe. She married. Um, a physician, Charles Homans. They came very early uh, to MDI. They were here in 1873 and they built this um, estate right where the schooner had overlooked parking lot is. And so they actually owned um, the land that encompassed uh, Anemone Cave as well. So she had um, a very close relationship with Charles Elliott. He was the president of Harvard College, and he also had started the Hancock County Trustees for Public Reservation. Both Eliza and Charles Elliott were widowed. They had both lost children. Um, both of their children had died, and so they found great comfort in one another's company, and he asked her to make a donation. So she was the first one to make a sizable donation to the effort to um, preserve the island. And her contribution was the bull and the beehive. As I said, she's, she was quoted as, my grandchildren may find a merry-go-round established there on top of the beehive unless I donate this. And the Homans estate has an interesting story. Um, the Homans property, the house and that land around it, was purchased primarily from funds from Louisa Satterley, and it was given to the park, and it served, the house served as the superintendent's residence. Um, that house did burn in the 1947 fire, and then the area was converted to the parking lot. Here's the Homans Path, and it was built in 1916 by George Doerr to honor Eliza Homans. And when she had made her contribution, she didn't want anyone to know about it. She asked that it be anonymous. Um, and after she passed away, he built this and allowed people to know who made that contribution. Our next family is the Brigham family. They were also down on Schooner Head. 
And it, this was Chief Justice Lincoln Flag Brigham. He was uh, a lawyer, Harvard educated. And um, he and his wife, Eliza, had three sons. They were all Boston uh, people and they, they were lawyers. Well, the wives of their sons, Kate Brigham and Amy Brigham, donated the funds to um, build the Brigham Path. It's a now abandoned trail, but it ran along the base of Champlain Mountain. The Schirmerhorn sisters are really dear to my heart. I just think they're adorable. Annie Schirmerhorn Kane and Fanny Schirmerhorn Bridgem uh, came from an incredibly wealthy family. Uh, her fa their father, Abraham Schirmerhorn, was involved in shipping. Um, their aunt was Carolyn Schimmerhorn Astor, and she was the queen of New York City society during the Gilded Era. Um, here's Fanny. She married Samuel Bridgham. And Samuel and Fanny built uh, what was called the Rockers. This was their house. This is uh, what, what we all know as the Ledge Lawn Inn. Here's Annie Schimmerhorn Kane. She, her husband was the great grandson of John Jacob Astor. Their house was down on the shore path. It was called the Breakwaters, which we all know about. And she uh, funded the Cane Path that runs along the Tarn in memory of her husband, John. He had been, John and his cane had been a member of the Bar Harbor Village Improvement Association. There is a memorial plaque to him at the beginning of the Cane Path. They also, the two sisters owned um, Lakewood and they donated all of Lakewood. And we can see that um, in 1929, uh, there was a bridge and a memorial stone that was designed by Beatrix Farron and installed at Lakewood. And on the boulder, the memorial boulder, it says in memory of Annie Cottonette Kane and Fanny Schimmerhorn Bridgen, who gave the lake and the surrounding land to Acadia National Park. And then those darn beavers, came in and just ruined everything. Uh, the beavers have caused that section uh, of the lake to be dammed up. And so the water level has gone up. And so our memorial rock is there, half submerged. Here's a, uh, another picture of um, Fanny. And I, one thing, one point I did want to mention about the two of them, the two sisters were incredibly generous. And Annie and Fanny, both set up high school scholarships. And you can still um, get a Kane or Bridgem scholarship. They had each um, set up a trust fund back then of $10,000. And um, Fanny's was to go just to girls uh, graduating from our high school, MDI high school, uh, for them to pursue higher education. They were known for um, being very, uh, generous, both to the hospital and the library and other organizations. And together, they also donated Kibo Mountain. So next, I'm going to go through the Memorial Pass. We've got Kurt Diedrich Climb, Beechcroft Path, Amory Young Path, and the Emory Path. So these aren't land donations. What they were were donations of funds to create um, trails. And the first one was Enid Hunt Slater. She funded the Kurt Diedrich Klein. This is a photo of Kurt Diedrich. And he was her nephew and he died in his late 20s. Uh, that would have been 1913 from complications in uh, surgery. Uh, this here is actually a picture of Kurt Diedrich's daughter, Elsa, on the Kurt Diedrich Klein. She's about 12 years old here. When Kurt died and his wife had, uh, had also um, died, Enid raised Elsa. And here's a recent installation of the Kurt Diedrich Memorial Plaque. Uh, we all know about the carving of Kurt Diedrich Climb on the stone as you begin, but there was also a plaque that was never mounted. And finally, it's up here and where the red arrow is, shows where Elsa was sitting in that photo. So who were um, the Hunts? Remember Enid Hunt Slater? Actually, her parents built Mizzentop, 
And Mizzen Top is where the Blue Nose Inn is. And it was right across from COA. Her, um, so you can see the Blue Nose Inn. You can see the ruins at the, at the base of it. Her father was William Morris Hunt. He was a renowned sculptor and painter from Brattleboro, Vermont, but he went to Boston and he was considered the premier Boston um, painter. Her mother was Louise Dumaris Perkins Hunt, daughter of a prominent Boston merchant and philanthropist, Thomas Perkins. She was the mother of Enid Hunt Slater and Eleanor Hunt Diedrich. Here's the Hunt family. And Paul Hunt was their brother. He actually had a house out on Bar Island. I, I never realized that there were in fact a couple summer cottages out there. And that's where Kurt Diedrich spent many of his summers growing up. So from early childhood, Mrs. Slater had spent her summers in Bar Harbor. She owned and occupied from some years, the house known as Bowling Green. And Bowling Green is on, on Eden Street, pretty close to where um, the intersection with West Street is. That, uh, so here's a little bit you know, from her obituary. It says, Mrs. Slater made friends everywhere and here in Bar Harbor, especially among the older residents. Um, she was endearing herself to everyone with sincere friendliness towards all. Um, she was well known for her interest in music and her home throughout the years here in Bar Harbor was a center for musicians. Many a young musician um, came to, her, she came to their aid. So now let's move on to Marie Hunt Young. Uh, this woman had funded a path, it's called the A. Marie Young path. And it apparently might have gone over a pre-existing trail, not sure, but this was funded uh, when her husband passed away around 1924. And he was Andrew Murray Young. And there is a plaque on that. The memorial plaque is near the southern end of the path. And on the plaque, it's dedicated in memory of Andrew Murray Young, who loved this island where God has given of his beauty with a lavish hand. They actually had an estate called Tanglewood and it was near the corner of Kibo Street and Cromwell Harbor Road, and that burned down in the 1947 fire. Uh, Marie Hunt was born in Brooklyn, New York. She actually was the widow. She, uh, Andrew Young was her second husband. She was a widow of Marion Story, a prominent miniature painter. Um, Andrew Murray Young belong, was a banker from New York, and he belonged to the Bar Harbor BIA. So I'm going to keep moving on since I have so many slides. We've got Layla Emery Anson. She funded the Emery Path in memory of her first husband, John Joseph Emery. And this is her. Layla Alexander, she was the daughter of General um, Charles Tripler Alexander and Julia Barrett Alexander. And what I thought was interesting, they were from St. Paul, Minnesota. But her parents actually had an, a summer estate very early on, um, kind of near... La Rochelle, but on the other side of the street. So Layla actually um, grew up here, summering. And like other women, when she married, she dragged her husband here. So um, she married John Emery. He was born in Ohio. And along with his brother, Thomas, they became wealthy through Cincinnati commercial and residential real estate. This was their estate, the Turrets. And it took them two years to actually construct the turrets. And apparently they used a lot of the exterior granite that was cut um, near Eagle Lake. Our next one is gonna be Anna Warren Ingersoll Smith. She funded the Beechcroft Path in 1915. She was the daughter of Edward Ingersoll and Anna Chester Warren, and she was from Philadelphia. She uh, funded this path in memory of her husband. The Beechcroft Path, if you look, used to, used to begin at Sirdemont Spring and Tarn area, and then it ascended the Pickett Mountain, which we know as Huguenot Head, to connect with trails on Newport, that's Champlain Mountain. Um, it used large flat stones. They were set for comfortable footing, 
Mrs. Smith contributed additional funds in the 1920s to further improve the path. So if you look, you know how nowadays you have to kind of go up a fairly um, steep stone step, but it used to actually come down to the road in a gradual descent. Here's a uh, photo of the Beechcroft path. And the path was actually named for their estate and it was located on Lower Main Street. If you look, you'll see um, there's still uh, a Beechcroft sign on one of the houses down there. So Anna and C. Morton Smith. Now we're gonna move on to Beatrix Farron. She was a prominent landscape architect who later married historian Max Farron. And uh, she was the only female of the founding American Society of Landscape Architects. Like these other women, she, her family had an estate here when she was a child. So she pretty much grew up summering in Bar Harbor. Here were her parents, Mary and Frederick. Um, they were both fabulously wealthy. And that phrase, keeping up with the Joneses, um, is named after this family. He was the president of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, Beatrix Farron's aunt was Edith Jones Wharton. She was the author of The Age of Innocence and Ethan Frome. And her parents, well, really, it was her mother. Um, her mother had separated from her father and they did eventually divorce. Um, she had Reef Point uh, built down on the shore path. And when she passed away, Reef Point went to Beatrix. And Beatrix attempted to um, start a horticulture center. She had hoped that um, students could come here, like going to a college and learn about plants. That ended up not being, um, that eventually failed from lack of funds. What Beatrix did for the park was just so much, but she did donate her time and expertise working with John Rockefeller to create all the landscape surrounding the carriage roads. They were very careful about the plantings. And what was so sad about it is all that work did burn during the, you know, in the fire of 1947. So we did lose a lot of her, her work and efforts. Now we come to Helen Pratt Dane. I love her hat. Look at that thing. She donated Wildwood Farms. Helen Pratt married Ernest Blaney Dane, a wealthy investor and president of the Brookline Savings and Trust Company. Her siblings, she came from a very wealthy family, the Pratts. Um, she lived in Brookline. She had a summer home in Seal Harbor, Maine. But they also, um, her husband was a partner of John Rockefeller. So that's why they were over in Seal Harbor. And they also bought this farm, the Hadlock Farm. And they used, they called it the Wildwood Farm. And they used it um, as a source of fresh vegetables and fresh flowers for their estate. So here's Wildwood Farm. And they had, a, um, the gardener lived in that house there. Here was their actual estate. It was called the Glen Gareth, the Dane estate. Um, it actually used to belong to the Cooksey family. All right, I'm going to move on now to Belle and Lucy Gurney. And they're daughters of Walter and Belle Barney Gurney. And they, uh, in the Bar Harbor VIA report, they voted that the grateful thanks of the VIA be and hereby is extended to Miss Belle Gurney, Mrs. H.H. H. Thorndike, that was Lucy, and Mrs. F.L. Hop Hoppin for the generous gift of $1,000 bond for the endowing of the Gurney Path through the woods above the Bay Drive. So you can actually, it's an abandoned path, but you can actually go up there and still see some remnants of it. They actually um, had this path built in honor of their uncle, Augustus Gurney. And Augustus Gurney built this estate um, down on Eden Street on the water side. It was called Beau Desert. And his niece, Miss Lucy Gurney, spent many summers there. They were just north of the tourists. And here's the remnants of Gurney Path. It was meant to be a walking path to allow people to walk from Bar Harbor all the way out to Hull's Cove without getting run over by those newfangled automobiles. So, you know, that was one of the effects bringing cars onto the island meant that it wasn't quite as easy or safe to just stroll around like people used to do. And so there's some beautiful stonework that's still there. 
Now we're going to move on to Pauline, um, Pauline Potter Palmer. Um, Pauline uh, was the wife of Potter Palmer II, the Hare Forest Estate on Schooner Head Road. It was formerly called Ledgecliff and was the estate of Lorenzo Kettle. And what Pauline did was to give land to the U.S. government in 1955. Here's Hare Forest. Um, it also burned down. She was the daughter of Herman Henry Colsat and Mabel Colsat, born and raised in Chicago, the daughter of a Chicago newspaper editor and a leader in the Republican politics. She married Potter Palmer II, the child of one of the leading families in Chicago. Their mansion in Chicago is just, it, it's a palace. It's just, it was just enormous. When he died in 1943, he left Pauline an estimated four and a half million dollars. She donated many uh, couture garments to the Chicago History Museum. And what Pauline's donation allowed was the completion of the Park Loop Road, that section of the road that runs um, between Sir Dumont, uh, the Sir Dumont Nature Center, and Sand Beach. It, it's the section of the road that goes by the precipice. Now we come to Louise Leeds. Mrs. Warner Leeds was born Louise Hartshort in New York City. She married, um, in 1894, uh, she married John C. Moore, and he worked in a brokerage firm. But John Moore was actually uh, from Steuben, Maine, and he went to Wall Street and made it good. And when he, um, with his money, came back, he decided to try and start a summer colony um, on the mainland. And he is responsible for forming Grindstone Neck in um, Winter Harbor. So when Mr. Moore died in 1899, two years later, uh, Louise married Warner Mifflin Lees. Um, Louise was a supporter of women's suffrage in New York State. In February, Lees, uh, 1910, Lees attended a mass meeting in Albany put on by the New York Suffrage uh, Association and the Equal Franchise Society. So John Moore had two daughters, Ruth and Faith Moore, and um, they had gone off to England. They both married um, British noblemen. And when Louise um, one day was having lunch with George Dorr at the Jordan Pond House, she said to George Dorr, would you be interested in all this land that my husband John Moore has down there on Squidic Peninsula. And George Dory said, of course I would. So Louise Hob, uh, went over to England to talk to Ruth and Faith about making this donation. And um, unfortunately, she passed away before all of the paperwork could be done. So it was left to Ruth and Faith Moore to make this donation. And um, they were staunch Anglophiles. And in deference to their spouses, they required George Dorr to change the name of the park from Lafayette to anything else. Dorr chose the name Acadia. And here we are, Scudic Peninsula. What a magnificent gift. Mary Ward Dorr was George Dorr's mother. But one thing I didn't know about Mary was um, what a skillful gardener she was. Dorr's mother served as the manager of the Association of the Bar Harbor VIA. She was the chairman of the Committee on Trees, later known as the Committee on Trees and Planting, until her death at the age of 81. Uh, during her chairmanship, over 100 trees were planted, in addition to vines and flowering shrubs. She was remembered for her simple and unaffected love for the wide world of outdoor life from the wild mountain wood to the flowers in her own garden. So um, the wild gardens of Acadia, uh, something that was kind of spread out more than what we have today and a little bit more centered around the uh, beaver dam pool. And um, this was her passion. But I mostly want to thank Mary Ward Dorr for giving us George Dorr. Here's her estate, Old Farm, down at Compass Harbor and constructed in 1878. Mary Henderson, uh, what a character. 
she donated her land, which extends from Route 3, right across from Sonnegies, and it goes all the way back, bordering Duck Brook. She was the wife of a U.S. Senator from Missouri, John B. Henderson, who co-authored the 13th Amendment prohibiting slavery in the U.S. Uh, she was an American author, real estate developer, and social activist. Um, Henderson was notable as a woman's suffrage, temperance, and vegetarianism supporter. There's another photograph of her. She was born in um, Seneca Falls, New York. She became a strong advocate for temperance and vegetarianism and published a book on health and diet called The Aristocracy of Health. When her husband died in 1913, she had his entire wine cellar, a 30-year collection of costly wines, emptied into the street. She died at age 90 in Bar Harbor, Maine. The, and the Hendersons actually owned this house. This is actually a yeah, boundary castle in Washington, D.C. Isn't that amazing? So given their castle in D.C., um, her house up here, this was called Glen Airy, the Henderson Estate, right across from Sonnegy, does indeed look like a modest cottage. Emma Baker Kennedy was the wife of John S. Kennedy. He was a banker and railroad builder. And John, Ken John Stuart Kennedy worked a lot with George Dorr, gave him a lot of funds to acquire things like the summit of Cadillac. Um, he had promised George Dorr that he would give him the funds to purchase Picket Mountain, Huguenot Head, um, but then he passed away. And Emma Baker Kennedy um, generously, when her husband died, honored his promise to support the HCTPR by sending the money for the purchase of that land. Like her husband, Mrs. Kennedy was a giver of large sums for philanthropic purposes, which were usually of religious or education nature. Like her husband, she gave so quietly that often her gifts did not become publicly known until long after they had been made. The total of her benefactions was estimated at more than $2 million. It is quite likely to have far exceeded that sum. And this was their estate, Ten Arden. And this is um, the land where the Colcutts now have an estate. And we're going to move on now to Christina Baker Rowe. This is Emma um, Kennedy's niece. She donated the land of her estate, the Barberry Ledge, um, and that was on Cleftstone Road um, after the fire. She was actually here, and Christina wrote a like about a nine page. Um, recounting of the fire. And she talks about washing her house and, and it was surrounded by fire. And then she goes, the whole house, just in a matter of a few seconds, burned down. And what a heartbreak. Um, she had grown up here. Uh, she had family here. Again, like I say, this was a multi-generational thing. Her own grandkids had played here. And this is all that remains if you go um, onto the property, which is now part of Acadia National Park, you'll see the ruins of that lovely home. Our next person is Janet Innes Aldridge. She donated the land starting at the bluffs. Um, I hope you all know what I mean by the bluffs in Route 3 and extending all the way back to Witch Hole. It was the former Ella C. White estate. Ella was a Philadelphia heiress to the fortunes of a coal and canal transportation business. Janet inherited this land through her first husband, William Wirtz White. And this is an old map of 1904. And um, I don't know, it's a little fuzzy, but you can see Ella C. White property and it's extending right out to Paradise Hill. Our next person was Mabel Sergeant Hayward. She donated 190 acres on the western side of Sergeant Mountain. In 1917, Mrs. George Hayward conveyed to the trustees 190 acres on the western side with a corridor running down to the Sound. And the holdings of the trustees on the western half of the island were be, um, begun by a gift by Dean Draper Lewis. So um, this uh, little corridor that 
they're talking about. If you go down, um, take a look at the map the next time, you'll see a little sliver of park land that runs right next to a stream. And I'm not sure what the purpose of that extended little strip of land was, but it could well have been to allow people who were boating to be able to land their boat, make their way up to the mountains without crossing over private property. So that is the end of my presentation. It was a lot to absorb and I'd be happy to take any questions if anybody wants to or set you all free. Yes, feel free to unmute yourselves if you'd like to ask a question. That was fascinating, Therese. Thank you very much. You know, I would someday I would love to see um, that on a map. Um, Wouldn't that we, be, uh, yeah, that's yeah, a great we took a map and, and wrote all of their names on it. Earl, yeah. did you have a question? Yeah, yes, he, I he did. Was waving. Thank you, uh, uh, Therese. Wonderful presentation. I think that's just oh, fa thanks. fabulous, as I mentioned earlier, make a great article for the Friends of Acadia Journal. Um, had you, you looked into some of the uh, contemporary uh, uh, female benefactors of the park? I know uh, Roxanne Quimby comes to mind uh, as someone who's yeah. uh, of this generation and others, and uh, uh, there might be some interesting aspects there as well. Oh, I, you know, I have left out um, a lot of women actually from this talk because we could go on till midnight and we're not going to. So yeah, it was definitely an incomplete list. And I do, I would love to, you know, keep expanding it and include more. But thank you. Great, great work. You know, what's so fascinating to me is that, I mean, all of these paths and, and some of the other um, places have the names of the men that they are honored honoring mm -hmm. but i i had never realized that they that it was actually given by the wife or the the aunt or so on it's very interesting well i do think you know this is a time when women were really asserting themselves more mm -hmm. and i think uh, if you notice this sounds a little ghoulish but once their husbands died and they had control over the pocketbook they were supporting the SBCA and children's orphanages and libraries, and they were spending their money um, on conservation efforts. So I, mm -hmm. I think that they had a, a keen interest in social causes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So if there's anybody else, uh, otherwise I'll have to say 99 to you all and thanks for um, stopping in to listen. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much.